on Christmas Eve, we, uh, I talked to you about uh, God being the greatest gifter of all. And we have traditions in all our homes and throughout the land of giving gifts to one another. But I wonder how often we consider <clears throat> the gifts that God has given to us in this life. <clears throat> On Christmas Eve, I spoke about God's gift of comfort in times of tribulation and difficulty. I also spoke of God's gift of uh, extra faith during the times uh, which are really hard and difficult for us to deal with. And I also spoke about God's gift for helping us through times of fear, worry, and uh, great anxiety. And we experience all those kinds of things in our lives. And so it's good to know that we have one we can turn to who will hear us and act upon those things and help us each day of our lives. And in my own personal life, I have experienced many of these things, but God has always gotten me through. And I guess the point of what I want to say tonight is this, that, that God will see me through from here until the end of my life when he takes me home. God will see me through. He will allow things to come into my life to test us as we all are tested. There are times when we are inconvenienced, but it gives us an opportunity to practice patience, to practice genuine love. So there are a lot of values, I think, uh, that come to us when we take the time just to think about the love of God that he's given to us so that we can give that to others and make a difference in the lives of others. I want to speak this morning, too, about uh, God's gift of protection. This is the difficult one because we all want to know for certain 100% that God is on our side and that we are on his side and that he is with us as we are with him. But I want to start, start with this, uh, this, uh, phrase, this uh, verse from 2 Corinthians 1.3. It was sent to me by Becky, my wife when I was in the time of great need, <clears throat> before we were married. It goes like this. It's written by Paul. Praise be to the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble. For with the comfort we ourselves have received from God, this verse tells me that there will be trouble. Jesus makes that clear, which I'll speak on later, that there is trouble in this world. We have trouble in this world. But God's way of dealing uh, with, it, with us is to give us comfort in the time of trouble, through the time of trouble, and we can know that and take this promise uh, that we read from Paul here to heart. Verse 5, just as the sufferings of Christ flow over into our lives... So also, through Christ, our comfort overflows. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. And our hope for you is firm, because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, so also you share in our comfort. And that was Paul writing a letter to the church in Corinth in uh, Greece. I wish I could explain suffering to you. I wish I could explain pain. And I wish I could explain all the evil that we have to endure in our lives as believers and even for those who are not believers. The, at the flood, God could put, have put an end to evil, but he did not. He allowed the evil nature of man to pass into the next generation and into the next and into the next right on down to us today. It is not that God could not pretend, prevent this, but that he did not. The only explanation is that, is that it is necessary for us to experience these things so that we can explore, enjoy the blessing of our salvation. For without evil, salvation would not be needed. And so in this, God makes it very clear for us that among the evil, in the evil that is in the world, we are saved from it. Jesus could have spoken the word and all pain and suffering and evil could have been removed, but he did not. 
He did, however, deliver people or remove suffering, pain, and evil from many, but not all while he was here on earth. Rather than remove evil, Jesus has given us the ability and the power to live in this world and to overcome everything that comes against us. Remember, God will take me from here to the end of my life, and he will teach me along the way many things that I may be prepared for that great day when I enter into paradise, and you as well. Listen to what Jesus said in John 16, 33. I have told you these things so that in me you, will, you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. And as Jesus lives within us, I believe that we can overcome the world and its troubles as well. We all have the choice to walk the narrow road that Jesus spoke about in the scriptures. With Jesus or on the wide road without Jesus, it is always our free choice to decide, and therein lies our problem. There are times when, in moments of weakness, we choose the way of the world, where we experience trouble. The weakness and the moments of trouble, uh, we will experience those until we determine to make an effort to stand firm in faith for Christ. Without evil, we would have no choice. So in one sense, our experience with evil gives us the choice to choose another path. And that path is the way of God. I view much of our lives as a test. Over time, these tests shape our character and mold us into the personage of Christ. Not that we are Christ, but that Christ lives within us. And when we live to the full potential that God has given to his people should be seeing Christ in us and being able to identify what we read in the scriptures with the kind of person that we are. And at the end of all those of us who follow Christ, we will hear, well done, good and faithful servant. That is our grand reward. And as we enter the paradise prepared for those who, are, who have chosen correctly or chosen right. But the question is, will God protect us? In Deuteronomy, we find this, be strong. Be courageous, Moses writes. Do not be afraid or terrified of them, for the Lord your God goes with you, and he will never leave you nor forsake you. Even if a believer is killed by a person under the influence, which is a real tragedy and a difficult thing for those in the immediate family and those who are close. But God has a place. Keep in mind that God has a place for all those he takes home. Because he loves all believers. He has this place for that believer. And at the moment of our departure, we will be with him in paradise. Keep that always in the front of your memory. Even during the worst of times in life, the Lord will never leave you nor forsake you. Your soul may leave your body and enter into eternity where peace, love, and acceptance will be a constant way of life. And I look forward to that. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 12, 1, about what he saw when he went to heaven. Listen to this. It's amazing. I must, go on boast, I must go on boasting, although there is nothing to be gained. I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. He says, I know a man in Christ, and I believe this man in Christ he's talking about is his himself. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up into the third heaven, so we know for sure that there's heaven one, two, and three. And I've heard some explanations, but not wanting to get into that right now, we'll continue on. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, Paul tells us, I do not know, but God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up into paradise. He heard inexpressible things things that man is not permitted to tell. And to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surprising great revelations that Paul experienced while he was in this third heaven, there was given to him a thorn in his flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment him. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he did not. There's got to be something to this. 
But he said to me, God said, my grace is sufficient for you, Paul, for my power is made in perfect weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships. Strange verse. Who delights in these? I think the delight comes from knowing that Christ will see us through. Deep, strong faith that Christ will never leave us. That is why, for Christ's sake, Paul continues on, and saying, I delight in weakness, in insults and hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And even in all these difficult times that Paul is experiencing, he writes this, when I am weak, then I am strong. So God gives us the opportunity to be strong in the middle of all the things that Paul just shared in his life, the difficulties, the weakness, the insults, the hardships, and the uh, persecutions. <clears throat> and then Jesus said this, Matthew chapter 10, 28, do not be afraid of those who can kill the body, those who are here on earth. Have no fear of what they will do to us. Have no fear of them taking our life. Have them no fear. Have no fear of them stealing things that belong to us or doing things to us that are not right and not just. But, Jesus continues on, do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill your soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. In this sense, Paul, Paul is telling us to fear God. Not that we are afraid of God so much, but that we have such deep faith and deep respect for God and deep love and reverence for him that we never have to be afraid. Remember what John writes, that perfect love casts out all doubt. In 2 Thessalonians, Paul writes this, but the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. We see this over and over again in Paul's life. Now Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 6, 3, we put no stumbling block in anyone's path so that our ministry may not be discredited. Rather, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way. In great endurance, in troubles, hardships, and distresses. In beatings, imprisonment, and riots, in hard work, sleepless nights, and hunger, in purity, understanding, patience, and kindness, in the Holy Spirit, and in sincere love, in truthful speech, and in the power of God, with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left, through glory and dishonor, bad report or good report, genuine let re yet regarded as impostors, Known yet regarded as unknown, dying yet we live on, beaten and yet not killed, sorrowful yet always rejoicing, poor yet making many rich, having nothing but yet possessing everything. That's a description of the life that Paul lived. How would you like to live that? He was facing all kinds of difficulty in his life. The Greeks wanted to have nothing to do him, the Jews wanted to have nothing to do him, nor the Romans. Yet he continued on spreading the wonderful message of Christ that how he can really be a, a valuable and a wonderful part of our life, even though he experienced all these things. But God could have taken all those things away from him, but God did not. There's some value in the hardships that God allows to come into our lives. We don't know what they are perhaps at the time, but as time goes by, oftentimes we can look back and say, oh my, now I understand. How many times have we had that thought when we were just about ready to leave the house and we had to run back in to get the keys or answer a phone call or something and then get farther on down the road only to see a terrible accident that we could have been involved in? I wonder, do you think that's God's protecting us? I think he does. Absolutely does. I think God wants us to learn, but he does not want us to experience the tri trials and tribulations in a way that causes us pain but in a way that causes us to grow and to become more of his, more like his son Christ. There are a few experiences all the apostles had to endure for, for the faith. 
There are many experiences all the apostles had to endure for their faith, but in all that, they had nothing and was able to say, I possess everything. That's what Paul said. Becomes the end of his life. He says, I have nothing, but I have everything. What is that everything he's talking about? That's this relationship with Christ, this love with Christ, this time that he spends with Christ in, in silence and by himself. He has that so that he has everything. And I think it's just the Christ living within him that gives him this assurance. Stephen is our best example of what goes on after the depth of tragedy. Luke writes, when they heard this, these are the Jews, they were furious. For Luke, for Stephen gave a, a speech before he was stoned to death to the Sanhedrin. And they didn't like what he said. And this is what Luke writes. When they heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him, Stephen. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing in the right hand of God. And I believe this is exactly what we see when we enter into that place called paradise. We will look up and we will see heaven and we'll see the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, Stephen said, see, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, the Jews covered their ears and began to yell at the top of their voices, and they all rushed at him, and they dragged him out of the city to begin stoning him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul, who we know later becomes Paul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold the sin against them. And when he said this, he had fallen asleep. In other words, he had died. God allowed him. He did not stop this. And there's a good reason for that in our own lives. This was certainly a witness to the church, even though the church was scattered after that, that what Stephen had to go through was real. But then Stephen, at the very last moment, he says, I see Christ. I receive Jesus. Jesus received my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold the sin against them. And then he fell asleep. So in summary, the Bible says a lot about God protecting us. And as humans, we want to see the protection as a magic force field that keeps us from all harm. Yet God has another way. Yes, God can prevent evil and the destruction in your life, but sometimes he allows it. But we must remember that we live in a fallen world where we have free will. And so when people choose to sin, they can be violent. During these times, we must submit to God's wisdom and trust him as we move through these experiences. Many times God works in ways that we do not understand. Sometimes, uh, sometimes God's protection comes in the form of an inner peace. Give us the opportunity to remain strong until we overcome the circumstances that has disturbed us. Other times, God's protection comes when he totally removes you from the trauma you face. And when he does, he will open new doors, giving you new experiences and opportunities. And I testify to that myself. But let all who take refuge in you be glad, the psalmist writes. Let them, be, let them ever sing for joy. Spread your protection over them, that those who love your name may rejoice. And the one we need to look to in the scriptures for a better understanding of this protection is David. David was protected from God in many situations. Personally, he was protected, even though he had sin. God was there protecting him. The eyes of the Lord, David writes, are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their cry. That is a promise. We cry out to the Lord to help us. He will hear us. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the memory of them from the earth. <clears throat> the righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them, and he delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. A righteous man may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. He protects all his bones. Not one of them will be broken. Evil will slay the wicked. The foes of the righteous will be condemned. 
The Lord redeems his servants. No one will be condemned who takes refuge in him. And Psalmist writes in chapter 46, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in time of trouble. <clears throat> Those are all good, wonderful things. And I believe them wholeheartedly that God is protecting me from evil, protecting me from uh, terrible things in my own life. But yet I will experience some difficult tragedies in my, what I call tragedies in my life. But they're not really tragedies to God. They're God's testing us so that we can become stronger in our faith and more mature. Where it really becomes difficult is when we begin to think about the Holocaust <clears throat> or the terrible storm that uh, the mid middle part of the nation had gone through. Where was God's protection then? God has a plan that we don't understand. Those who were uh, faithful to God, he took them immediately into the paradise, and I'm sure they would not want to have come back. We may look at it as a tragedy, but God can turn it into something beautiful. But even in the Holocaust, there were difficult times for the people then. But whose fault was that? It wasn't the... It wasn't necessarily God. God allowed these people to continue to sin and to follow sinful ways, and even the church involved itself in the, in the, uh, in the murder of uh, six million Jews. Nations all around did nothing, but they stepped back and just listened and turned their ears deaf. Where was God in all this? He was there. And each and every one who lost their life, God took into paradise and they are with him forevermore. So we need to think of God's protection in the long term, in the long haul. Yes, we will go through difficulties in our life, we will suffer tragedies in our life, but God is always there with us, giving us comfort, giving us help, and continuing to protect us. We need to think about that as a gift. It is Christmas, and God gives us these gifts every single time, every single time we need them. So let's, not re let's just remember during the time of Christmas how God is really the great giver of the greatest gifts in our lives as he develops us and prepares us for a wonderful experience in eternity. In Jesus' name, and we thank you. We'll close with uh, a few more songs, if that's okay. <clears throat>